Okay, this, um, this video, I want to go through one of the problems that I assigned as a way to help you all uh, reassess what you remember from previous material in this course and even previous courses uh, in order to help you understand your readiness for continuing on so you know if you may have to go back and review some uh, older material as we go along here. Okay, so the very first problem that I assigned, um, I think actually brings us home quite forcefully. And here's the question, question number one, an upper layer packet is split into 10 frames, each of which has an 80% chance of arriving undamaged. If no error control is done by the data link protocol, how many times must the message be sent on average to get the entire packet? Okay, so the idea here being is that uh, the large packet is divided into 10 frames by upper layer. What do we mean by that? Well, if you remember, uh, the layers go from physical layer at the bottom and they go up through link layer and so on, all the way up to the application layer at the top. And uh, each layer above uses the layers below to help it in this uh, transmission, data transmission process. Okay, now, so one of the upper layers, only uh, uh, each packet only has a, a chance of, um, uh, a relatively small chance uh, of getting through. We're saying an upper layer packet is split into 10 frames each has an 80% chance of arriving undamaged. Okay, so we try to send it. Packet doesn't get through. There's an error in one of the frames. Then we try to send the whole thing again. There's another error. And then we try to send the whole thing again. There's another error. So the question is, on average, how many times do we have to try to do this uh, before we get the entire packet going through, all 10 frames? Now, the, the solution, I decided to go through the solution in uh, a lot of gory detail here, but uh, let me explain this to you and then I'll, I'll discuss it. Since each frame has a chance of 0.8 of getting through, the chance of the whole message getting through, okay, all 10 frames is 0.8 raised to the 10th power. And then you do that computation, it's about 0.107. I'm going to call that value P. So P is the probability, okay, that all eight, uh, all 10 frames go through. Uh, now, so we take the probability of a correct uh, frame transmission to be P. Um, uh, I think probably should have, that should be, uh, uh, I don't know if it's a frame transmission or packet transmission there. Uh, there, um, a failed transmission has the probability of Q is equal to 1 minus P. So if P is the probability that it doesn't make it, 1 minus P is the probability that it does make it. With uh, retransmissions, it takes n attempted transmissions to get a frame through at the first frame, okay, uh, to get a frame through at the first n minus 1 try. So it gets through on n means it must have had n minus 1 failed attempts with the nth attempt being successful. So that's what happens if it takes n transmissions uh, to get through. Then if the random variable x is the number of transmissions to achieve this success, uh, the probability that, what is the probability that, uh, let me ask the question, the question, what's the probability that x equals n? Now, they want us to compute the expected number of transmissions. Okay, and this is what I'm going to compute. But first, let me ask the question, the probability that x equals n is computed as? Now, as I said, uh, right here, we have that right here, shown it right here. Let me uh, mark that in here, red. Okay, right here right there. Okay, the probability that x equals n, um, that is the 
nth is the first correct transmission. It means we had failure on the first n minus one transmissions. That's probability is here because each of those first n minus one um, uh, has a probability of one minus p or q. So we have n minus one failures. So that's q to the n minus one. The finally, the nth one is successful. That's so that we multiply that by p. And then this product here is in fact the product that, that x equals n is the first uh, successful transmission. We want to find the expected value of x. Now, if you remember the definition of expected value, as we, depending on whether we're doing with a discrete or a continuous random variable. Here it's a discrete ran, random variable. So it's the x equal n is the value that x takes. So it's n times the probability that x equals n. And then we sum over all possible values that the random variable can take, which is what this sum is right here. Okay, so that's what we have right there. Now, Let's look here. Uh, let's plug in some numbers. Well, we just computed the probability that x equals n uh, up above. So we plug that in there. So we get uh, the second sum in on that line. Uh, it's the sum n goes from 1 to infinity, n times q to the n minus 1 times p. Now notice that the p term is independent of n. So it can come out of the sum. It factors out of the sum. So we have then. Uh, this term right here, all the way on the right, this one right here, is what the expected value uh, of the random variable x happens to be. It's p times the sum of n times q to the n minus 1. Okay, so now let me just take this all out here. I don't want it to get too cluttered. Okay, so now... It is the expected number of transmissions, that's what this mu sub x is, is the expected number of transmission attempts to get a frame through the network. Recall the important sum. Now, I'm asking you to recall this because um, you know, for me, this is an important sum. It's one of the most important sums in all of mathematics. Um, I think you've seen it before, and uh, but you may not remember it, and that if q is less than 1, then the sum n goes from 0 to infinity of q to the n is equal to 1 divided by 1 minus q. So let's examine that briefly here. We have um, what happens if q equals 1? Well, we have the sum n goes from 0 to infinity, and then q to the n is 1 if q is equal to 1. So we have an infinite sum of the number 1. So we have that the sum n goes from 0 to infinity of 1 as we're adding 1 an infinite number of times, so that's infinity. So, and then what happens on the right side of this equation, if q is equal to 1, we're dividing by 0, and you might think of that as also taking on the value of infinity. So it works out certainly in that limiting case. Um, now you can check it. One of the things I frequently have students do is uh, pick a value for Q and do the sum on the left. Write a program. Uh, it's a sim be a simple program because you're just summing up a bunch of, of values there. You can do it in a, in a simple uh, loop. And, uh, for example, if Q is equal to 1 half um, and you look at the expression on the right, 1 over... 1 minus a half is 1 over a half, and that's 2. So if q is equal to 1 half, the answer for that sum should be 2. And then plug in q is equal to 3rd. Uh, and I think you should get the sum as 3 halves, and so on. So you can write a little program to check that if you're not sure you believe it. Okay, now, but this sum goes from 0 right here. Uh, right, uh, uh, this sum goes to 0. But we want a sum that goes from 1. Okay, and also uh, the sum down below isn't exactly the same as the sum up above. So let's continue with this. So we find that uh, we want our sum to start at 1, uh, and the only difference between the sum starting at 1 and the sum starting at 0 is the sum starting at 1 is missing the n equals 0 term. 
So the n equals zero term, q to the zero, is one. So the sum starting at one is the same thing as the sum starting at zero minus the n equals zero term. And that's exactly what this is. So we have one divided by one minus q, and then minus the n equals zero term, which is one, and a little bit of algebra, and you get that the sum n goes from one to infinity of q to the n is equal to q divided by one minus n, as shown right there. Okay, so let me take these out here. Okay, so far so good, I hope. Now, let's uh, continue. Now, something that I hope you uh, uh, touched on in uh, calculus, maybe you didn't, is that um, if, we, if we know a particular sum, and in this case, we know what the sum is from n equals 1 to infinity of q to the n, uh, we can <clears throat> calculate the sum of a different sum by doing integrals and derivatives of the sum that we already know. Well, what do I mean by that? Now, let's look at this expression right here. Okay, so I know what this sum is right here. I've just figured that out. Now, if I, uh, that's equal to this thing right here. So if I know that ddq, if I know what that sum of n equals one to infinity of q to the n, let me take the derivative with respect to q. So I take the derivative, the derivative passes through the summation because the derivative of a sum is the sum of the derivatives. Now I'm not going to go into all of the tricky math details, which you might go into if you take um, an advanced course in analysis or real analysis, because sometimes uh, you can't pass the derivative through the sum. And, but the cases when you can't pass the derivative through the sum are when the sum uh, doesn't exist or you know, blows up on you or there are some other problems. If that sum converges, um, typically, most of the time, if it converges and if the final sum that you get after taking the derivative also converges, um, then it's okay to take the derivative and pass it through the sum. So we pass the derivative into the sum. And if we do that, let me write this down here. We get the sum n goes from 1 to infinity, and now we have d dq of q to the n. Now we know that um, the derivative of q to the n, we know what that is, so we get 1 to infinity, and the derivative of q to the n is n times q to the n minus 1. So lo and behold, if we take the derivative of our sum on the left, we get this sum right here, and this sum right here, if we look up here, is exactly this sum here that we want to compute. Compute. So let's see how this works then. Okay. okay, so we pull the derivative into the sum, take the derivative with respect to q. Um, so we get the, the sum that's shown on the right, the sum n goes from 1 to infinity of n, q to the n minus 1. That's what we get the derivative when we do term by term the derivative inside the sum. And we also know that the sum n goes from 1 to infinity of q to the n equals this. So if we, the, this thing right here. So we know if we take the derivative of this, that should equal this. So we want to do this expression right here. We take the derivative of q divided by 1 minus q, and that should equal that sum, which is exactly the sum we want to compute. So let's examine how that works. OK. Um, I'm not going to go through these details. It's uh, simple taking the derivative of q over 1 minus q. I think you should be able to do that. Um, you, can either, you can use the quotient rule of derivatives. I may have told you before, I, I actually never use the quotient rule. I, I take a quotient and I just write it as a product, where one of the terms of the product is raised to the negative 1 power. And then I use the product rule. So either one. 
Okay, so um, we take the derivative of q over 1 minus q, and when I do that, I get this thing, okay, which you can get after a little bit of algebra. We know that that's equal to this thing right here. Okay, now this thing right here, which is 1 over 1 minus q, remember that 1 minus q is equal to p. So this thing equals this thing right in here. So indeed, here our sum that we're trying to compute is equal to 1 over p squared. Okay, now let's come back up here. We're trying to compute up here. We have the value of p times that sum. And we just computed that the sum is 1 over p squared. So p times 1 over p squared is 1 over p. And so this thing then equals 1 over p. And that is the value, the mean value of x right there. So that's how that computation works. I, uh, I hope uh, that this little video helps. Um, there are several little tricks involved that you may not remember, such as the derivative of a sum giving you another sum and so on. And uh, so good luck with this. And uh, uh, I'll see you next time and see you in class.